Good afternoon and welcome to our orthopedics and sports medicine lecture series. I am Dr. Rogelio Uribas, Corporate Vice President of Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend our warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. And I will be your moderate, moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. James Ross, orthopedic surgeon at Baptist Health Miami Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute, his presentation titled, Joint Preservation, Restoration Rather Than Replacement. Dr. Ross is board certified orthopedic surgeon and is fellowship trained in sports medicine and joint preservation. Dr. Ross received his medical training at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts, followed by residency in orthopedic surgery at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, where he trained under the tutelage of leaders in the field of orthopedic surgery. Sorry. After completing residency, Dr. Ross completed a fellowship in sports medicine and shoulder surgery at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He then joined the faculty of the University of Michigan Department of Orthopedic Surgery in the Division of Sports Medicine. He also served as head team physician for Eastern Michigan University Football and Athletic Department. Since relocating to Florida, he serves as a team physician to the Florida Panthers as well as Florida Atlantic University and Lynn University. Dr. Ross has achieved national and international recognition for his clinical research. He has published numerous articles and authored several textbook chapters in the field of orthopedic surgery. He has presented at numerous national meetings, including the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, Arthroscopy Association of North America, and the NFL Team Physicians Meeting. Dr. Ross has also presented his research internationally and was the lead author on a paper that won the 2013 Basic Research Award at the International Society for Hip Arthroscopy in Munich, Germany. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. James Ross. Doctor. Well, thank you for, uh, so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, thank you to Baptist Health uh, International Program. Um, I look forward to being able to present uh, this topic, which is very dear to me, um, about joint preservation and trying to uh, keep the joints of, of the patients that we treat. Um, and I welcome all of you that have uh, tuned in to listen, and I hope that this can be beneficial and generate some questions at the end of the talk. So without further ado, I will start my presentation. Okay, is my screen full and, and normal, looks like it. You're ready to go, doctor. Okay, so as, a, as I mentioned, this talk is about joint preservation, which is restoring the joint rather than replacing the joint. So joint replacements, um, these are just uh, pictures about of some of the knee replacements and hip replacements that can be for, performed for patients with osteoarthritis of the knee or osteoarthritis of the hip. But how do we avoid um, coming to this solution as a um, as a pro as pain pain generators. So the way I want to divide this talk is I'm going to talk about the hip and I'm going to talk about the knee. So the first thing we'll do is talk about the the hip. So when most patients present to offices complaining of hip pain, some of the more common diagnosis that we see um, and treat is osteoarthritis of the hip, and we really have kind of one solution, which is to do a hip replacement. But what do you do in this situation where you have a young patient who is complaining of right-sided hip pain and they do not have arthritis and, they, and it's not bone on bone? So in order to determine what's going on with this patient, sometimes I think it's helpful to take a step back and really look at the anatomy uh, because that can give you some ideas of what can cause pain. So the hip joint is a relatively inherently stable joint. It's a ball in a socket. So the ball over here, which is the femoral head and the socket, which is the acetabulum. Now on the surfaces of these bones, as well as the surfaces of other bones within joints, 
there is something that's called articular cartilage. And that's the, the smooth, shiny stuff that you see here, um, the smooth, shiny stuff that you see on the ends of chicken bones. And that creates a nice friction-free environment that allows the joints to move around smooth. And this is the uh, substance that's lost or worn out in the process of arthritis and can cause pain. Now, the other substance that I'll mention, mention is this ring around the hip, which is denoted here in L, and that's the labrum. The labrum is another type of cartilage, kind of like the meniscus in the knee, that helps to create a suction seal effect in the hip, but can also be a pain generator. So here, if we look back at an x-ray, you see how there's that space in between the femoral head and the acetabulum? Well, that space is represented by the things that you can't see on x-ray. As we mentioned, the blue being the cartilage of the acetabulum or the socket, the green being the cartilage of the femoral head or the ball, and then this pink structure on the end, which would be the labrum. So how do you get from an x-ray here on the left where there's joint space that looks to be well-preserved to the x-ray on the right, where there's complete bony destruction, osteoarthritis, bone spurs, et cetera, which is causing severe pain in a patient. So if we look at young patients who have hip pain, there's a process which is called femoral acetabular impingement. And what femoral acetabular impingement is, is it's a process, a mechanical pathologic process due to a malformed femur or a malformed ball or potentially the socket. And this concept, which has been re-emerged recently, was initially described back in the 1930s by Smith, Peterson, and Stolberg as a pistol grip deformity. And this is actually a picture from that initial uh, publication showing how the ball is, is more flattened on the side here rather than perfectly being round right next to what this, this pistol grip handle would be. But it wasn't until 2001 where this gentleman here, Professor Reinhold Gons of Bern, Switzerland, formulated and kind of redeveloped this concept of femoral acetabular impingement as being a precursor to osteoarthritis of the hip. And he developed or kind of coined the terms of cam type impingement on the left and pincer type impingement on the right as being these types of impingement. Cam type impingement is where there's an extra bump formed here or a bone on this neck, and that causes a sheer injury to the cartilage in the labrum and further pain. Pincer type impingement, on the other hand, is more of a deepened hip socket, which can dig into the neck and also cause a crush injury to the labrum and subsequently pain as well. And what he did is he, he explained that this can lead to lesions of the labrum and or the cartilage and ultimately osteoarthritis of the hip. And with surgical dissections and, and different studies, he developed an open surgical hip dislocation technique where he could safely access the hip to create some of these underlying deformities and hopefully treat this and prevent the further deterioration of the hip joint to correct the labrum as well as reshape the bone. So what about having a more minimally invasive way to treat this? And this is where we're really talking about the cutting edge of hip arthroscopy. So about the time that he developed in this concept and started developing this open hip surgical dislocation technique, a lot of these pioneers that you see on the screen were developing and further treating problems with arthroscopy or camera surgery. And arthroscopy for many years was already very well established in joints like the shoulder and joints like the knee, but the hip was relatively um, a virgin um, exploration because really it's a very tight hip space that you really couldn't get into and access and really was only used to, to take out loose bodies or in settings of trauma. So this is actually a, an arthroscopic picture of what this process looks like. So here you see the femoral head or the ball on the right, this white cartilage. This is the acetabulum. And this metal instrument that I'm using is a probe, which I use as almost an extension of my finger to feel some of these different <coughs> disease processes. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing a bruised labrum. You're seeing stripping of some of the cartilage on the socket and really this uh, loosened or delamination of the cartilage 
from the from the socket's rim all caused by this mechanical process of impingement and that's what causes pain in these patients <clears throat> so what can we do in this situation this is a video of what we're doing arthroscopically to repair the labrum so after localizing these lesions and, and finding these labral tears in the hip, we can put a series of anchors which are drilled into the, the socket that have stitches attached to it. And we can use various suture passing devices in order to pass these sutures around the labrum and subsequently tie them in order to suture and repair this labrum back to where it was and thus repair this labral tear. And here you're seeing the video of cinching down these sutures and these knots and um, repairing this labrum and helping out with this patient's pain. And here probing this, you can see that the labrum is now stabilized along the rim. But the question is, is, is what do we do about the process that, that caused this from happening? Here you can see on the x-ray the bump in this patient. Here's another view of that bump. So in a perfect world, if we draw a circle around this head, the normal shape of the neck should be something like that dotted line. So part of the process of treating this surgically would be correcting this bony impingement to prevent the labrum from re-tearing and allowing it to heal. <clears throat> so how do, we, how do we plan for this? Well, there's a CT pro, uh, protocol that can be done in order to generate three-dimensional CT scans of uh, patients' hips and they can be uploaded in various software programs um, that are commercially available. This is one software program that I was involved in during my training and helping to perform some of the initial research for and uh, used for a lot of my research projects. And here what you can do is you can plan for your surgical correction on the right and essentially take away the bone in this software program to try to come up with a plan on what you want to do at the time of surgery. Here we see on the right hand screen here, a virtual x-ray of what this x-ray should look like at the end of the surgery once you've planned for the appropriate uh, resection and appropriate correction to restore this hip shape to what it should look like. And here's a preoperative x-ray on the, on the left and now you're seeing the post-operative x-ray on the right showing a lot more uh, restoration of this neck junction to correct that underlying impingement. So we'll move on now to the knee and some of the different uh, avenues of joint preservation for the knee. So again, let's look at the knee anatomy. The knee is composed of the femoral condyles, which are the two bumps that you see up top here, as well as the tibial plateau. And again, similar to the hip, we have a articular cartilage on the end of each bone. And instead of a labrum, what we have in between is we have these C-shaped cartilage discs, which are called the meniscus. And then finally, the, stable, the stability of the knee really relies on a lot of the ligaments in the knee, such as the ACL and the PCL, which are some of the ligaments you commonly hear about athletes injuring in, uh, in sports. <laughs> So here's a patient, another young patient that has left knee pain that's limiting his sports, limiting his uh, daily activities and his, his athletics. But again, you see good joint space between the two bones. <clears throat> Here depicted by the colors again, the blue being the articular cartilage of the femur, the green being the articular cartilage of the tibia, and then the pink structure being this meniscus. So if we get an MRI, we can see some of these structures. And what I have here depicted on the right hand is a uh, depicted a sagittal image of the medial femoral condyle. And what you see here is you see a gap in the cartilage from here to here. This black line that I'm outlining is the end of the bone. This gray structure right here is the cartilage. And what you see is as you follow this around, it kind of comes to a stop where there's complete bony exposure, and then the cartilage kind of picks up again. So this patient had this isolated cartilage defect that was causing him pain, popping, mechanical symptoms, as well as swelling. And here's a picture of what this looks like during the time of arthroscopy. This is a portion of the condyle that has normal cartilage, but as you flex and 
the knee, that brings into view the area where the cartilage is completely worn down. And this pink that you're seeing right here is actually the bone. So how can we treat this? It's an isolated cartilage defect. This patient's too young and has only a focal area to do something like a knee replacement. Well, there's various different ways that we can treat cartilage defects uh, throughout the knee. Something as simple as a chondroplasty, which is a cleaning up of the uh, cartilage flaps. Um, another type of procedure, which is called microfracture, which has been around for the longest, and that's drilling holes in the bone to try to stimulate cartilage growth, which doesn't really grow real cartilage, but more of a scar cartilage that's not quite as durable. Other various things that you can add in addition to the microfracture, such as biocartilage to try to stimulate the stem cells to grow more like regular cartilage. Uh, cadaver cartilage plugs, which is considered an oats, or even the patient's own cartilage, which is ACI, Cardicel, or a newer type of cartilage procedure called a MACI, M-A-C-I. So this is the patient who's um, MRI and the interoperative arthroscopy that I just showed. And this patient had some underlying bone cysts, so I elected to proceed with a cadaver cartilage and bone plug. So what we do is once we have this as a patient who's a candidate, we send their MRI off to a graft uh, company. And that graft company uses the MRI to measure different measurements of the knee and the condyles to try to match this to a fresh, freshly obtained cadaver specimen. And these are usually young patients um, in their late teens, early 20s that have died for uh, usually a traumatic reason like a car accident, et cetera. And once the patient's size is available, the graft gets offered to the surgeon and the patient to be used. And this is something that's freshly obtained in a sterile environment and needs to be used within about a, a couple of weeks after, sir, after the uh, harvesting of this tissue. And then this gets shipped in a solution to the hospital for which we can use during surgery. So what we do during these procedures is we actually core out and cut out the area of the cartilage and bone defect. And in the corresponding area from the donor cartilage, we can actually plug in a piece of normal cartilage and normal bone that has the exact same contour as the patient's anatomy. But the other thing that we need to think about is what caused this problem. So similar to the anatomy of the impingement causing cartilage problems in the hip, oftentimes we can see mechanical alignment problems causing cartilage defects in the knee. So if we look at this patient, we obtain a long leg standing alignment films and we draw a line from the center of this patient's hip down to the center of the ankle. And what you see is that line travels through that compartment, which has the diseased cartilage right there. So if we just proceed with treating the cartilage alone, there's a chance that this may not be as durable and may not last as long and be successful. So what we can do is we can actually perform what's called an osteotomy where we cut the bone, shift it <coughs> and wedge it open so that the joint line um, access travels more through the center of the knee. So this was the planned correction for this patient was six degrees of correction. And this is the actual alignment films that were obtained after surgery demonstrating improvement of this patient's mechanical access. So what about in some types of instances where the bone is healthy and we're really we're, we're dealing with a surface only or cartilage only problem? Can we repair the cartilage alone? Which would be just denoted by that red structure right there. Well, as I mentioned before, these are some of the options that are more just for palliation and repair and restoration. We've already talked about the osteochondral allografts. But let's talk now about autologous chondrocyte implantation, where we actually use the patient's own cartilage to, to regrow and implant in these defects. So autologous chondrocyte implantation, which is denoted as ACI, 
That was re first reported in 1994 in Europe and wasn't FDA approved in the United States until 1997. And what's done is that cartilage cells or chondrocytes are harvested from the patient and they are isolated in a laboratory. They're cultured, they're grown up, and then eventually can be re-implanted into the patient's knee. Now, the first generation of this ACI was very cumbersome and surgery was very challenging to do. What we had to do is that these, these chondrocytes or these cells were mixed into a solution, a liquid solution, and it would get sent to the, to the hospital after it was grown up. We would have to sew in a patch with very, very small sutures that you can see in this picture here and leave just a very small opening that was large enough to fit a syringe underneath. And we would inject this cartilage uh, liquid solution under the patch and then seal up the patch. And then eventually the cartilage would adhere to the bone and grow. Outcomes were fantastic. Outcomes were very good, excellent 20 to 30 year outcomes. The problem is, is that many surgeons didn't want to do this because it would take several hours and it was very, as I mentioned, cumbersome to do the surgery. Well, in Europe, they began doing a procedure which is now called MACI, matrix autologous chondrocyte implantation in the year 2003. <clears throat> and the way that that's different is rather than the cartilage being um, implanted in a liquid solution, but the, now the cartilage cells are actually embedded and placed onto a collagen implant that's directly implanted into the defect. So it takes away the need to have to sew in all of, all of uh, this membrane and inject the solution, solution. So it's a much easier procedure that's able to be done um, and more uh, replicable by the surgeon itself. And recently in the United States in 2016, this was finally FDA approved 13 years after uh, they were doing it in Europe and had many, many years for Europe to collect uh, data with excellent outcomes. <clears throat> so, so let's talk about using this Macy implant for cartilage repair. So there's really three key steps that happen for treating these types of surface or cartilage only defects. So first step is a surgery where we assess the defect and that's done arthroscopically with very small incisions. We go into the knee, we take a look at the defects, make sure they're isolated, that it's not a diffuse cartilage uh, disorder that we're dealing with. We measure the defects and then we take the cartilage biopsy. And that biopsy gets um, sent off into a, into a cartilage solution. And eventually these cartilage cells are isolated they're grown up in solution in the laboratory and then eventually seeded onto this membrane. And then the patients come back for a second surgery, usually a couple months later, and then that implant and that membrane is implanted into, uh, into the defect. So the first step is the defect assessment and cartilage biopsy. As I mentioned, we examine the defect. Is this something that's contained, meaning isolated and has good cartilage around it? Is there any bone loss that we have to worry about, as well as evaluating these dimensions? And really this is indicated for, for an area of cartilage defect that is greater than about two squared centimeters and not involving any substantial amounts of bone. So the next step during that procedure is to, to take the biopsy. And this can be done several different ways. But the key is creating is obtaining this biopsy full thickness so that we get really those healthy stem cell chondrocytes to grow up in the lab. Uh, we obtain these cartilage biopsies from areas of the knee that are not um, necessarily articular and are not important for the knee. So there's not any secondary damage. And we usually pull out two pieces of biopsies that are about the size of two individual Tic Tacs. So here's, a, an arthro, or here's an arthroscopic video of me obtaining the biopsies. This is in the center of the knee where the ACL and the PCL reside. And what I'm doing is as I'm taking this ring curette in order to create a full thickness cartilage biopsy. Here you see me using a grasper to pull that out. And then again, 
um, going back in with this brain curette in order to obtain another biopsy um, to be passed off uh, to this cartilage solution. <clears throat> now this cartilage solution is then uh, shipped in a refrigerated container up to um, their lab, which is currently uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. So as I mentioned, we, we place this into this cartilage solution, fill out the appropriate patient information, and then package and send it on its way. So in the lab, um, the cells, once they're grown up, they are adhered to this collagen membrane. And this is a picture of what this membrane looks like. It has a shiny side and a rough side. Um, so it's dual sided membrane. The smooth surface is really the, um, the uh, collagen membrane, whereas this rough surface, this is where all of the uh, cartilage cells or the um, chondrocytes are adhered to these various uh, collagen membrane fibers. And here you can see an electronic microscope image of these individual chondrocytes that are attached um, to the collagen fibers by their cytoplasmic projections. So when we implant this in surgery, it's very, very important to make sure that we have the appropriate side facing down towards the bone, this rough side, because that's where we want those cartilage cells or those chondrocytes to adhere to. So now it's time, they ship the membrane to us and, and it's time for surgery. So what we do is we actually have to perform an open incision. This, is, this cannot be done arthroscopically at this time. Um, the defect is, um, is again assessed. The flaps of cartilage that are not healthy are removed so, so that we have a nice area of surrounding healthy cartilage. And we take the rest of the, the scar cartilage down so that really all you're looking at is healthy bone. And once you've been uh, removed all of this tissue, we like to create a template, usually out of some aluminum foil as, as, a, as a template so that you can use this template to transfer over to the membrane to, to get that exact size um, fit into that defect. So here, what you see is you hear it see cutting and shaping around this, this foil membrane um, uh, template around the cartilage uh, membrane in order to get that exact uh, implant created. Here's just a video of what we do once it's cut out. We apply a thin layer of fibrin glue to the bone. And then this membrane that we've cut out and, and sized appropriately gets placed with that rough surface down towards the bone where the chondrocytes are. And we essentially just kind of manually hold some digital pressure there for a couple minutes and allow the fibrin glue to adhere over eight minutes before, uh, before completing the procedure. Now, sometimes if this <clears throat> tends to be a little bit larger of a defect, I like to suture this membrane in as well on the edges, maybe in the corners, just to make sure it stays in place. So here's an actual image from one of my patients. This is the backside of the patella or the kneecap. So you can see that there's a pretty sizable defect here in this patient's cartilage. So here's that foil membrane that you, that you cut out to try to create that template of how you want the membrane to look like. Here on my hand, on the glove, you can see this pink, uh, surface of the membrane itself that I've cut out to that size. And then finally on this right image here, that's the actual image of the Macy implant in place. So once that's in place, we, we prevent any sort of motion in the knee for 48 hours to allow the cells to adhere down to the bone before we start any motion. So what happens, uh, I guess, microscopically or histology? So what happens is these cells migrate off of the membrane through the glue and they adhere to the bone. And over a period of several months, these chondrocytes, which are alive, they're genetically programmed to make these type two collagen matrix proteins and everything that's found in normal hyaline cartilage and essentially grow up to the surface of the adjacent cartilage. And some people ask, well, why, you know, how does how do the cells know when to stop growing so they don't overgrow? And that's where the therapy becomes very important to allow for motion because the other cartilage that's opposing that defect by moving across the area kind of keeps, keeps the cells 
uh, growth in check and prevents it from overgrowing. So again, we want to create an environment that's um, optimal for this Macy implant. So we need to address all the comorbidities, morbidities prior to surgery or at the time of surgery, similar to before. So as we talked about, that would be alignment, stability, as well as another issue, which is the meniscus. So alignment, here's a specific patient example of a patient I did uh, just last month. You can see this is the patient's medial femoral condyle, which is on this inner portion of the knee. You can see a very large cartilage defect. This is after the membrane was applied. And then here's the patient's mechanical alignment prior to his osteotomy, and that's afterwards. So now we've created a nice environment for this cartilage to grow over time, um, as well as realign the patient's weight-bearing axis to hopefully allow this for him to last for uh, several years. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is meniscus integrity. So lots of patients who um, have had meniscus tears in the past, uh, perhaps have had surgery where uh, they've had a, an arthroscopy where, where the surgeon went in and cut out the meniscus. And sometimes that can lead to problems down the road. Here's a patient who has knee pain after a meniscus surgery where the meniscus was removed. And what you see is you see the front portion of the meniscus here, but on this slice of the image, there's no meniscus in the back of the knee. So this patient had a near complete removal of the, of the back portion of the meniscus um, and was still having pain after the surgery. Here's an image of what that looks like at the time of surgery. You're seeing normal meniscus tissue on the, over here on the left, essentially no meniscus here, and then the meniscus starts to pick up again here. And when the meniscus is gone, the function of the meniscus, which is to distribute the patient's weight across the cartilage, is gone as well. So you can start to get cartilage damage from this and, and early cartilage disease. Fortunately, if you catch this early enough, some of these treatments are, are available. So just as we can perform cartilage implants, we can perform meniscus implants. So this is a video I put together of a patient who had a meniscus transplant done, again, from a cadaver. We cannot currently grow a meniscus in the lab, probably one day in the future. But at the time of surgery, what we do is we remove all the remaining patient's meniscus. And then what we, what we can do is prepare to put this meniscus in. So this is an outside or lateral meniscus that I'm, that I'm um, transplanting. And my technique for that is I like to create a trough that connects the front portion to the back portion of this meniscus that I'm implanting. It's a dovetail technique is what it's called. And here, what we do is we have this meniscus that's shipped in, in a, in a biologic solution. And we make a series of cuts around the meniscus in order to create a nice bony plug that the front and back horns of the meniscus are attached to that we can essentially slide into that slot that I already created arthroscopically. And here's an image of that meniscus with that bony dovetail slot. So once this is all ready to go, we put a stitch in to bring it into the knee. And then now that the bone is anchored in, we anchor in and suture in the remainder of the meniscus around the knee using some of these different uh, suture passing devices or meniscus suture needles that go through the knee um, and eventually get tied over the capsule or the lining of the knee to help create and secure this meniscus in place. Um, and this requires, again, a lot of work, um, a lot of sutures uh, that are placed. It's a surgery that needs uh, several hands to help out in this procedure. But at the end of the surgery, this is what it looks like. So you go from a patient that had no meniscus in the back of the knee where this marker is on top of the meniscus to now having a complete meniscus back in place and hopefully help with prevent further uh, cartilage destruction and arthritis. So joint preservation surgery um, in the appropriately indicated patient can have reliable outcomes for pain and function. And some of the rapid evolution of these techniques and treatments, however, um, however great these procedures are, 
it must be followed by well-performed investigations to make sure that we're really helping patients out with their with uh, their future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, very informative. As a as a knee patient myself, I was paying attention to every moment you were talking about the knee and the hip by any chance. Um, so um, I'd like to remind anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to go into the Q and A component. Um, we have our first question um, from uh, Abraham Wise Leader. Regarding the meniscus repair, what's the criteria when you have to choose between a partial or total knee replacement and a meniscus repair? So um, that's a good question. So whenever, when someone has a, um, a meniscus tear that you're trying to decide on surgery, whether it's uh, removing a portion of the tear, which is called a meniscectomy, uh, repairing the meniscus or suturing it together, or as you mentioned, a knee replacement. A lot of that is whether you do a meniscus surgery or a knee replacement is really ultimately dependent on uh, what the status of the patient's cartilage health is. So if they have substantial cartilage loss on both sides of the joint, then that type of a patient may be best treated with a, with a replacement, whether that's a full replacement or a partial replacement. But what I can say is that um, the more and more that we're learning about the importance of the meniscus to preventing arthritis, there's been a big push to try to be very aggressive about repairing and suturing meniscus tears if it's in a zone that is amenable um, and has good blood supply. Thank you. And that question, uh, actually, Mr. Weisleder, uh comes from UC Med, which is uh, was my university in Costa Rica, Dr. Ross. So I'm, I'm okay. proud the, the alma mater represented today. Um, question from uh, Ms. Nishanda Tynes. What are the lifespans of the various knee replacement or repair techniques? So knee replacement surgery, um, I think, continues to evolve. I think from a standpoint of predictability for replacement joints, I would say that hip replacements are the best currently. I think that those are very predictable at, at getting long-term um, excellent outcomes, 20, 30 years plus. Uh, the knee is, is continuing to be refined. I think the joint is a little bit more um, complex than a standard ball and socket joint, but I think with some of the current uh, plastic and metal bearing components, the wear rates are a lot less. So probably getting at least 20 to 30 years on a replacement. Um, as far as some of these cartilage techniques that I mentioned today, uh, some of these long-term outcome studies are showing about 80% longevity at 20, 20 years and maybe 70% 70 70 at 30 years. In the appropriately indicated patient. So if uh, the patients have the ability to have some of these preserving procedures, you know, that can be, that can be excellent for the patient's life. And that question had come from the Bahamas, doctor. Okay. Next question uh, is coming from Jose Chacon from American University of Integrated Services. And the question is, great presentation. What is your take on PRP injection, stem cell, and other forms of joint preservation? Um, I think that I think we still have a lot to learn um, from some of these biologic injections. Um, there's been some really excellent studies that have come out over the last year to two years that have looked at PRP in the setting of arthritis in the knee. So. For all those uh, in attendance, a lot of times for arthritis in the knee, we're injecting cortisone. Uh, we know it's going to be short-lived, maybe three months. Um, probably, if it's done very frequently, has some 
negative side effects for potentially progressing the arthritis. So other types of injections that are more healthy to the knee have been explored. One that's been covered for several years uh, under insurances is something called hyaluronic acid, which people often say is the gel or the chicken juice. Um, and that's a more natural injection because it's a substance that's already found in the knee. It acts as a lubricant. It acts as an anti-inflammatory property and patients can have very good results from that. PRP is what's called platelet-rich plasma. And that's where your peripheral blood is drawn. Um, it's put into a centrifuge to essentially kind of spin down the cells and we isolate the growth factors and inject that into the knee as an anti-inflammatory property. Maybe there's some sort of regeneration that occurs. So with that outline of these injections, as I was alluding to, there's been a couple of really good research papers that were randomized control trials looking at the gel hyaluronic acid versus PRP and actually showing that the PRP injections performed better for pain as well as patient outcomes six months and even a year after these injections. So I think there's a lot to learn. Um, and even with stem cells, whether that's stem cells that are derived from the patient's bone, stem cells that are derived from the patient's fat. Um, the options are just immense. And I think that we still have a lot to learn on this before we determine what's gonna be uh, the solution. Next question, doctor from Sherry Ann Brooks, SDA in Jamaica. Can a labrum tear be repaired without anchors? Well, <laughs> good question. So um, I think that some traumatic tears can heal with non-surgical treatment. Um, the, and that would be someone that has an acute injury to the hip, maybe like a car accident or, um, or they fall funny onto their knee and the hip subluxes and it tears the labrum. I think those tears have an opportunity to heal. It's a very, I think those are a very different tears than ha that happen as opposed to these tears that occur over time from impingement or dysplasia, because that's a wear and tear pattern. I think that in those situations, uh, the mechanics just don't allow these to heal on their own. Now, in some conditions, such as dysplasia, where patients have a shallow hip socket, and the labrum is torn, there's often surgeons out there that will fix the dysplasia or the shallow hip socket by cutting some of the pelvis and, and reshaping it, and they leave the labral tear alone, and they're convinced that it will heal after the mechanics are restored. So it's a very good question. Next question is, and I hope I, I pronounce this correctly, from Trinidad, from Brydens, uh, from Chris. The Vertuio uh, question is uh, for ankle replacement surgery, surgery in young patients, what usually happens after 10 years, after the 10 year uh, lifespan on the current replacements? I know we didn't talk about ankle, but uh, now I guess, can you help us with that one, doctor? I'll, I'll humbly admit that I, I don't know too much about ankle replacements. Um, you know, when I did my residency, I guess almost 10, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it was still in its infancy. And I know a lot has changed since then. I have a foot and ankle partner that does a, a fair amount of ankle replacements, but I could not uh, honestly tell you what the current uh, lifespan of the ankle replacements are. We can, uh, we can pass that one on later to uh, Dr. Uh... Dr. Hodgkins and Dr. Yeah. San Giovanni, we can, or your team over there, foot and yeah. ankle, and then we can get that question later. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, Tracy Galvin, Cayman Islands, 57 year old active female, six months post op hip arthroscopy for FAI, cam impingement, and labrum tear. Recent MRI shows hip now has severe osteoarthritis with osteophytes and rear labrum tear. A hip replacement is indicated. I prefer a resurfacing procedure. Would that be a better option? Question mark. 
Um, you said 57 year old female. Is that correct? Yeah, hold on. I'll go back because it it, uh, it cycles through once I answer the oh, question. I'm sorry. 57 year old active female, six months. Okay. Post mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Um, so, yeah, so I guess a couple of parts to that uh, question. So, when, and I'm not sure what this patient's health of the cartilage was before the surgery, but unfortunately, it sounds like this one didn't turn out as good as it. It was hoping for um, some patients that have arthritis already in the hip don't do well after a hip arthroscopy. <laughs> so this patient was still having pain at six months and um, and sounds like needs a uh, some sort of a replacement. So you asked a question about a replacement versus a resurfacing. So a replacement is for for everyone um, just kind of a generalist term. A replacement is a small ball that's inside of a plastic liner, um, which is in the socket. A resurfacing is um, a surgery where the a cap, a metal cap, is put on the top of the of the head, and then the socket has also a metal cap in it. So it's actually a metal on metal um, bearing surface, as opposed to metal or uh, ceramic on a plastic. Um, these surgeries, the, the resurfacings were done on lots of patients, probably in the, in the, you know, between 2005, 2015, a lot of replacements or resurfacings were being done, um, with the hopes of regaining better function, the ability to run, et cetera. And a lot of problems happened, uh, from metal on metal. So, uh, lots of these pseudo tumors that grew from the hip from all these metal ions that were being shed. And the, from what I know, and I don't do uh, resurfacings or, or replacements anymore, but from what I know is that the resurfacings are best done in male patients that have big anatomy. The females that have smaller femoral heads, they have maybe some shallow hip sockets, there's not enough surface area of the metal implant to really distribute the force as well. And I think that those are the patients that really ended up with high amounts of problems. So without seeing this patient's x-rays or, or seeing what they look like in person, the, my guess is that the best predictable option for this patient was good, would be a conventional hip replacement surgery. Thank you, doctor. And Ms. Brooks, I apologize for some reason, registration said Jamaica, but she's from Cayman Islands, doctor. And she says, my tear wasn't repaired with anchors. Uh, I also have FAI. So next question is from Linda Mermelstein. Uh, this question is from Clinica Red in Costa Rica. Very interesting. Can the MAI, MACI procedure be done on a 60 plus patient who has such wear and tear and now is basically bone on bone contact in the knee or is the MACI only for meniscus repair? Also, if you mechanically correct the posture on the effective side, isn't one creating a asymmetrical posture between each leg and possibly creating a future orthopedic issues? I guess she was talking about the uh, the one with the hip and knee malalignment uh, that you talked about. Yeah, a uh, couple of great questions in there. So um, currently the, the Macy procedure is indicated for patients, I believe 55 years of age and younger. Um, if someone's bone on bone, then they are not a candidate. It has to be only cartilage loss on one side of the joint. Um, and then alluding to the mechanical access that's actually that's you got to be careful when you align these patients because if one if both sides are for instance bow-legged and you straighten out one side too much where they become a little knock need you end up with one knee that's knock need and one that's bow-legged you get what's called this windswept deformity where the patient feels like they're kind of always falling off to one side so it's definitely a valid concern and something that we talked to the patients about prior to surgery. 
Thank you for your question. And uh, Mr. Galvin said, thank you for answering my question. Very interesting, appreciating the lecture series. Thank you, Mr. Galvin. And Linda just said, thank you for answering the question, doctor. Thank you. Um, what can produce a crackled sound after a meniscus repair? Well, um, that could be, could be various things. Uh, it could be scar tissue. Um, it could be some of the sutures that were that are um, causing some irritation of the meniscus. Could be part of the meniscus that didn't heal. Um, if assuming that it was a repair rather than having a trim out, if it was a meniscus surgery where they trimmed out the meniscus, that could crackling could be progression of arthritis. The question is whether you know, it, depending on if it's painful or not. If it's painless and it's just a, a, a sensation of popping, oftentimes that can just be from, from surgery itself. Thank you. That question is from Carlos Acero. Thank you for your question. And the next question, doctor, I don't know. Uh, it says how to tell if proper alignment of the knee and hip joint for a lower extremity amputation is in place. Uh, Mr. Gorin, can you uh, retype uh, that question? I don't really get it. I don't know if you understand what he's asking there, doctor. How to tell a proper alignment of the knee and hip joint for, an, for a lower extremity amputation is in place. Um, I'm not sure. Me neither. We'll wait for him to expand on that. Okay. Um, we're going to go with floor M. Excellent exposition in your experience. I would like to know the time evolution and presentation of symptoms of bilateral, severe bilateral co coax arthrosis. What's the time and evolution of, of arthritis for after, after a surgery or after, I guess what? I, it doesn't say after surgery. So why don't we go with after surgery or before surgery, just in case. Um, well, I guess progression of arthritis in just the normal population is, is very wide and, and um, really unpredictable. I mean, there's patients I see in my office that have been marathon runners for 20, 30 years, and they come in with a little bit of knee tendonitis and we get x-rays and they've run 40 marathons in their lifetime and they have hardly any arthritis as opposed to like the patient, the 40 year old patient that tries to pick up marathon running and they can't do it. They come in and they've got severe arthritis. So development of arthritis is multifactorial. It's genetic, it's weight induced, it's activity driven. Um, but if you're looking at uh, the, the progression of arthritis after per, perhaps like a meniscus tear where <coughs> the meniscus is removed, um, that's very determined also on multiple factors, including how much of the meniscus was removed, um, what the patient's body happiness is like, if they're, if they're heavy, as well as if there's any other ligament problems in the, in the knee. Apologize. That question, Flor, is from uh, Worldwide Seguro. So thank you, Flor. I hope that answered your question and you joined. We've had all types of folks join on on these questions, Dr. Ross. Some have been physicians, some have been students, some have been consumers, and now you even have representation of medical managers from insurance companies. I have a couple of questions for you before we, uh, before we end is, how many surgeries usually does a doctor have to perform to get a certain level of experience to be able to do this, right? Dr. Ross, we're always afraid of of folks that try to do stuff before time, right? Oh uh, man. When, when do you know that the person you're gonna go to would be <laughs> able to do this? Um, I hate to put you on the spot, but no, I, I, know you know, I know you know the answer. Yeah, so there's, it's, it's, a, it's a process. I mean, that's fortunately with residency and, and training where we actually get to see a lot of uh, of these surgeries done um, and help participate in some of the surgeries. I think it's very important. Um, there's, uh, there was a study that was put out recently in, um, 
in uh, in a journal that looked specifically at how many hip arthroscopies were needed in order to uh, to really have uh, expertise uh, expertise level of of being able to um, successfully do hip arthroscopy and I'm blanking on the, the exact number, but it was it was several hundreds that were required in order to um, in order to feel confident enough to be able to perform hip arthroscopy at a level that was that was considered to be uh, successful enough. And I think that that applies to to many of the surgeries that we that we do. Um, I just found the the paper here. So it was a systematic review and it looked at hip arthroscopies that were done and it showed that for hip arthroscopies, over 519 arthroscopies in a career had the lowest rates of repeat surgery. So like 2% versus 15.4%. So 15, 519 hip arthroscopies, that's a lot. I mean, I do about 150 a year. So, you know, obviously a lot of these cartilage procedures and things aren't done very frequently. Um, you know, I probably am doing these, these Macy implants at least a couple of months or so, but it's something to, to ask your surgeon and hopefully they're honest with you about how often they do it. Um, you know, it's also good to find a surgeon that's relatively new out of training, but far enough out of training where they're, where they're familiar with some of these up and coming techniques. Well, doctor, time flies when we're having a good time. It's been a good time. So thank you so much for, for, for the presentation. I, I, I'm, uh, it was, there was a lot of questions asked and we really appreciate everybody asking all the questions. And so on behalf of Baptist Health International, I would like to thank Dr. Ross for his informative presentation and all of today's participants for your attendance. If you have any additional questions about today's presentation, please feel free to email them to us at bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. That is bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. We will make sure to get your questions over to Dr. Ross and that way he can answer them uh, on a future date. We look forward to seeing you at our next orthopedics and sports medicine lecture series scheduled for Wednesday, June 15th, 2022. Thank you again. Be safe and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor.